speaker. So Dr. Lawrence Yoon is the chief economist and senior vice president of research at, at NAR. Uh, he oversees the association research activity and the development of proprietary statistics, such as NAR's existing home uh, sales statistics, affordable home index, home buyers and sellers profile, and the commercial and international reports. Dr. Yoon creates NAR's forecast and participates in many of the economic forecasting panels and is widely quoted and appears regularly on financial news outlets. He's a frequent speaker at real estate conferences throughout the U.S. and provides expert testimony before the United States Congress. He's also hilarious, so he's our chief comedian at NAR also. But with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lawrence Yoon. Thank you, Sir. Uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for the introduction. Believe me, uh, I don't make jokes. So when you laugh, I don't know whether you are laughing at me or what uh, apart. Um, well, uh, you are here because you are a realtor. And you decided to become a realtor back when you chose because you said, well, maybe I can make a decent living or maybe a comfortable living. But in the process, something else occurred. You sold the home to a client, and you feel certain intangible happiness that your clients are happy in getting that home. And over the years, you see your past clients doing well because they are homeowners. You do the next transaction, you have that feeling again. So, there's this intangible value that you provide, that your, home, your client's feeling super, super happy. I bring this up because, as you know, 2024 has been a very difficult year on many fronts. Even in your pocketbooks, according to the statistics, we did not get the home sales recovery this year after an awful 2023. But I want to show you something about you, what your clients are feeling. This is the household equity in real estate. People who are owning property, how much equity do they have? The pri price of the property minus any mortgage they owe. Record high, tremendously high. We did have a little decline back in 2008, 2010 when the subprime risky loan blew up. But then NAR advocated in Congress to say, let's make sure it never happens again. Congress passed the act, the ability to repay act. Show your income, make sure you don't overstretch your budget before getting a mortgage. But huge increase in wealth, your past clients. This is $35 trillion. Anytime we go into trillion, we lose the real world feel. What does that mean? Well, let's put it in terms of if I can advance the slide, which is not advancing, uh, the divided the number by number of home owning households. This is about $450,000 just in housing wealth. If they have stock market wealth, they're also doing the extra gains. But these are your past clients, showing tremendous loyal from the fact that they are part of the ownership class, owning part of America. We know this chart. You have seen many times the wealth difference between homeowners and renters. And homeowners' wealth steadily rise while the renters simply spend their wills, which we are all familiar with. Maybe we did not know the exact figure, but these are the exact figure, something to show it to your clients. This figure is for home buyers who purchased their home when the mortgage rates were 12%, 8%, 18%. It did not matter. You have to be in that blue bar to participate in the blue bar. In America, as you know, one can always refinance their mortgages when it goes down. But if you don't enter, you are in that renter class where the wealth is not being accumulated. This is the wealth by age category. So not surprisingly, younger people have lower wealth compared to people in the prime working age. 
maybe people are 75 and older, they're using some of the wealth they accumulated and then you know, using that for their retirement years. But you see the steady growth. And you say, well, younger people, it takes time to build wealth. But part of the thing is home ownership. Home ownership rate is much lower among the younger group compared to older group, which we are familiar with actual figures. And this is implying that if you want to participate in that wealth, the sooner you get into the market, the better off. Now my colleague, Dr. Lautz, who will be coming in uh, after me, will show that first time buyers struggle this past year. Hard to get into the market. But the home ownership rate clearly demonstrating that over time, one is acquiring wealth. But not every city is equally benefiting from home price growth. These are four cities related to recent presidential election. Cincinnati, J.D. Vance. Rochester, Minnesota was the closest metro market in Minnesota where uh, Tim Walsh uh, would be associated with. South Florida, say Miami, West Palm Beach, Donald Trump, and the Bay Area, Kamala Harris. So we see the variation. This does not mean somehow people in the Bay Area are doing tremendously well. It just means that if you ask a random person from Bay Area, or you are making a guess, they could be super wealthy, like at the bar chart shows, or they could be the majority. Majority are renters in Bay Area, not getting this wealth. So this wealth difference is partly attributed to what types of jobs are being created in the local area, certainly Silicon Valley, you know, stock options, you know, that is clearly facilitating, but it could also be related to the supply restriction. It's not only about the demand and high income of the local area, but about the supply. If there is a continuous restriction on bringing more supply, and when I talk with a California realtor, they say, yeah, it's almost impossible to build a new home in California. Well, it's just leading to greater divide between the owner and the renters. But in markets like Cincinnati and Rochester or the Midwest, the wealth gain is a little softer because the demand is not as strong. This is the price movement comparison between the West and Midwest over time. I could choose other regions, your market, one could easily do a comparison, but I'm just showing you this uh, gap that has been opening up between the West region and the Midwest. Part of this gap is due to the Rocky Mountain states really getting more new people into the region. So it's not only about California, Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington, uh, but the Rocky Mountain states really getting this huge price growth. But in the Midwest, you can say very steady, but the wealth gain has been more modest because the job market situation has been more difficult in the Midwest. Let me illustrate it with this. Michigan was one of the blue wall states. How is it going to vote? Well, one economic data point related to the job is that if you look at Michigan from year 2000 to 2010, they had a great recession continuous job decline from auto industry restructuring. And then they started to recover until the COVID hit and Michigan interestingly had a longer lockdown than other states. So it took a little time to come out of it, but now they're coming out. But even coming out, there are still fewer jobs in Michigan today compared to pre-COVID. That's why the Midwestern home values are not firming up greatly compared to the other regions. Contrast that with Arizona, same timeline. There's always economic cycles, ups and downs, but overall, you see how much job addition. In addition to many retirees who don't want job who are moving into Arizona. This is the job situation from pre-COVID to most recently available data state-by-state state comparison. If you're in one of those green states, you are doing very, very well. Just to illustrate, if you are in the state of Texas, 10.7, 10.7% more people working in the state of Texas compared to pre-COVID. More people work, they have the capacity or certainly a much better position to buy a home. 
housing demand, or even commercial real estate demand. If you're in the light blue, it's difficult. Blue wall states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, all light blue. Job addition has been positive, but one of, on the lower tier level situation. This is the electoral map of very close race back in the year 2000. Remember the Chad counting in Florida, all that part of the situation. Incredibly, the blue state, red state division looks almost similar except for one or two or three states. Almost similar. But something else has changed. The electoral college weight. Because you saw the job numbers in Arizona, and you saw the job numbers in Michigan. Generally speaking, we are seeing some states lose population, other states gain. So from the year 2000 to the most recent election, Florida electoral college power went from 25 to 30. So if it's the same color, you see how it could uh, tilt. Texas going from 32 to 40, region 11, and they are region. And I know you cannot name all those five states. If you can, I will give you a little bonus points at the end. But Region 11 has seen huge growth. Their electoral power has increased, which also means that there are states and other regions seeing the electoral college decline. But very interesting that the colors has barely changed over the time period. And the reason for Midwestern industrial manufacturing center showing more modest home price growth from more modest job gains is that manufacturing power center has been labeled at times as a rust belt. Companies closing, shipping out, going to China, Mexico, other places, Vietnam, other places. But we are beginning to see some manufacturing revival. I think this is a campaign issue of both. I know that uh, Harris and Trump, so much polarization. But if you're looking for some commonality, both campaigns said, yeah, let's do something about reviving the Midwest, whether in terms of uh, things like Inflation Reduction Act, which is a misnomer. It was not about inflation, but trying to provide a little subsidy so there could be more manufacturing capacity. And we are beginning to see more manufacturing plant completion, construction completion at the moment. So maybe this is an early sign that maybe American factories will get going a little faster than before. Whether it will be in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, or whether it's gonna be in Kansas, North Carolina, I cannot say, but we are seeing more manufacturing completion here in the US, clearly implying that 100% outshoring may be coming to an end. Maybe the tariffs will uh, you know, lead to even more greater turn up uh, in this situation. Always a trade-off, put a tariff, a little higher prices, but then you are bringing more jobs back into America. But the home sales, where you are, finances are dependent upon. So your clients are doing super well. They are super appreciative of your help. I know some of the media is saying, oh, the, you know, some of the clients, uh, maybe uh, they got short change in the real estate transaction. No, your clients, and you know it, they're super appreciative of the help that you provided. But your business does not depend on home prices. It depends on home sales. And home sales right now has been very difficult in the past two years. So what are we going to get? Job numbers, it's been positive. Some states doing very well. Again, Florida, Texas, doing very, very well in terms of job. Are we going to see acceleration of job growth? Trump growth? or is something going to hit a speed bump and we could hit a recession? Well, the stock market is very optimistic, and maybe now the companies want to expand more facilities given the stock market has recently risen uh, quite strongly. What about the mortgage rate? In second Trump presidency, first Trump presidency, mortgage rates were bouncing around at 4%. Maybe only one, two, or three months, it may have touched 5%. So the mortgage rate in the first Trump president term was good old days, 4% mortgage rates. Are we going to go back to 4% mortgage rates? 
Well, my forecast, unfortunately, is not. Mortgage rate in the second Trump presidency will be something closer to 6%. 5% small probability, I would not exclude it, 5% probability, 5% uh, mortgage rate could happen, but I think it's a more smaller chance. I think the new normal will be 6% mortgage rate, which means that it's gonna bounce around at five and a half and six and a half most of the time. This recent week, mortgage rate touching closer to 7%. Now the blue line is not the mortgage rate, it's what the Federal Reserve controls. And Jerome Powell yesterday said, if President Trump asked him to resign, he will not. <laughs> because according to the legal structure, it's something like the Supreme Court. You're appointed, Jay Powell was appointed by President Trump, once you are appointed, you cannot be fired. There's one difference with the Supreme Court. Supreme Court judge position is for lifetime. Federal Reserve is for a certain number of years. And once that year finishes, President Trump can decide to whether reappoint or not reappoint. So, but President Trump cannot fire him in the mid of, middle of his uh, term. But one thing the Federal Reserve will be doing is the following, the blue line. They cut rates again yesterday after the big September rate cut. They will do so. I think my advice to Jay Powell is do it in January and not in, September, not in December. People are saying, is it going to be December or January? Well, I think there's a little ego from President Trump. He wanna see it in January rather than seeing it in December, and I don't think it really makes much of a difference because there will be about four additional rounds of rate cut in 2025. So the blue line will be declining. But the mortgage rate, the reddish line, refused to decline. Because something else has happened from the first Trump presidency, first term, and the second term. And it is budget deficit. Back in the earlier days in the graph, 1990s, even up to 2005 period, Two lines pretty much matched up. Government spending in that orange line, tax revenue in the green line. Then the gap opened up. Usually gap opens up when we have a recession. People lose jobs, they need some help, so government spends more money. But look where we are today. We have a massive budget deficit at a time where economically we are not in a recession. Only what you close the gap is either to raise taxes, the green line, or bring the government spending down. And clearly, President Trump will not reverse his past tax cuts. He will extend it or even expand it. Like the, uh, for people working at a restaurant, tip income, maybe that will not be taxable anymore. So the only way to address deficit situation in the future may be to bring the government spending down. But we'll see how it goes. The House of Representatives, the control is still outstanding. We still don't know, but even though it looks like probably uh, it's going to be a trifecta, which means that uh, President Trump will own this administration or the policies over the next four years uh, conditions. But we have large budget deficit. So how does the budget deficit impact this? Very simple. Government borrows, borrows, borrows. The private capital that was able to lend the money out is getting soaked up. There will be less mortgage money available because government is borrowing so much of that money. So large budget deficit will prevent the mortgage rate from going back down to the good old days of 4%. It's not gonna happen. Your clients, some may be waiting, oh, I remember President Trump, 4% mortgage rate. You have to explain why it is not likely to happen. Now the deficit is high. When the deficit is high, usually the currency depreciates to say, look, your country is in a mess, we don't trust you, and therefore the currency will be weakening. But what's happening in the US dollar is getting even more powerful than before. So how is it that US is running a huge deficit, 
but the dollar is indicating, oh, globally, people still place confidence in America. How are you going to finance the deficit? Print money? Well, we still believe in America. This is what the chart is saying. Then you look at other countries. What's happening in Italy? What's happening in France? What's happening in China? What's happening in Japan? Their finances are worse than America, so given the, but who has the worst budget deficit, you can say, well, America's situation is pretty bad, but it's actually better than other countries, and maybe this is why the dollar is rising. But something has to give. We somehow have the intuition to say, no, you cannot be a free lunch. You cannot keep running budget deficit and ex expect free lunch. And what it's giving is that gold prices are rising. People are trusting paper currency less than before. They want something more tangible, just in case the paper currency really gets wiped out over time if the budget deficit is not under control. So the gold prices are rising. One can't even say cryptocurrency uh, is rising because of less trust uh, in the government finances uh, globally. Now, mortgage rate can decline if President Trump do the following. First is, related to the budget deficit, if this administration can come up with a credible plan on how to reduce budget deficit over time, I think the bond market will react positively and mortgage rate could uh, go down quite quickly. But during the debate between Harris and Trump, I heard no question about the budget deficit, neither campaign talking about the budget deficit situation. But another way to bring the interest rate down is bring the housing costs manageable. It's certainly been a good news for homeowners in the recent past. But this strong price increases that's been happening, it cannot simply continue for the next five years. If it happens, America will be completely divided. America will become something like the Bay Area housing market. Few getting tremendous wealth, large majority renters never able to enter the market, never able to make progress in America. So a way to get the housing costs under control is we have to have more supply. I'm sure you heard from other advocacy forum, NAR advocacy team, Shannon McGann's team, that we are trying to do everything to boost supply. So what is President Trump saying about the supply? First, less regulation. You know, get out of the way so the builders can build more. So he is saying that. Second, he wants to turn some of the federal land, you know, small slice of federal land, make it easily available for the developer so we have more housing supply. It's already happening to some degree, I heard from a, a realtor from Las Vegas, that some a small slice of land, the government is offering for free of charge, uh, therefore the land cost is low, so now they can build more affordable housing. I also heard from realtor in Massachusetts, where some of the state-owned land they are offering for conversion into affordable housing. Again, reduce the land cost so there can be more supply. But bring more supply so that home price increases are not outrageous, but more in line with income. If income rises 3%, home prices rises 3 or 4%, you know, that's pretty much in line. We cannot have a sharp division in home prices and income over a prolonged period. Another way mortgage rate can decline is the following. This is the number of people who are out of the labor force. People who are not even looking for a job. The line in the middle is COVID arrival. Somehow COVID came and boom, a lot of people went out of the labor force. Now, we think we are back to normal. We have a meeting, in-person meetings, people are gathering. But look how many people are still out of the labor force. Five million additional people out of the labor force. Get these people back into the market. It will help reduce inflationary pressures. Lower inflation automatically means Federal Reserve can make even deeper cuts and also mortgage rate could also decline further uh, despite the budget deficit situation. So home for sales forecast is 2023 was difficult. The blue is home builders. 
2024 looks to be almost the same. Again, two straight years of very difficulty. Pending home sales, we did get an increase in September, implying maybe the worst is over. 3% uh, gain, I mean, it was hard to see on the pre previous gain, but this is percent change. So with that little red at the very end, it's showing positive. So maybe the worst is coming to an end. And month supply, builders have plenty for month supply, but for the realtors, the red line is also beginning to turn upwards. More inventory potential for more business. Certainly you are seeing either yourself or your agents who are now getting out of the office, putting the for sale sign on the yard, getting more movement in their body. Inventory beginning to increase. And I'm always scratching my head over this. We have 88 million homeowners, but did you know that 35 million homeowners have no mortgages? So when we talk about lock-in effect, you know, people have low interest rate, they're not gonna give it up. What about this blue bar? How are they impacted since they, are not, uh, they don't have a mortgage? And I've been discussing in other settings where life-changing events, such as newborn babies, marriages, divorces, people in returning 65, uh, all this will lead to more inventory showing up. This happens in a 12-month time period, and it will reappear in the next year, same numbers. So one can anticipate more inventory, more inventory, more inventory. So the worst in inventory is coming to an end, pending showing a slight gain, and maybe the mortgage rate stabilizing. The frenzy days are over, the number of offers settling down to pre-COVID days, and the days on the market now beginning to show a little more seasonal patterns. Before, it was all multiple offers, winter, spring, it did not matter. But now, during the winter months, homes are staying on the market a little longer during the winter months. Population in the meantime, we have 70 million more people living in the country, and I put those red bar because this is when we had the home sales comparable back in 1995. So the fact that we have this many people, we have so much stored up potential demand provided the conditions are right. Stabilizing mortgage rates along with more inventory, maybe we will get more home sales. So the forecast. It's just like trying to forecast, you know, how many inches of rain uh, or snow. I'm going to be wrong. But directionally, I think it's going to be about roughly 10% boost 2025 and 2026. Home prices will be much more moderate growth as more supply comes onto the market. Mortgage rates stabilizing at near 6%. Job growth, it looks like we're not going to face recession, stock market booming. But let me do two more non-real estate areas. This year's Nobel Prize winner is this person. I don't know her. I never knew her. But as soon as she won, I read a little through it, I became immensely certain sense of pride. Why? She grew up in the same city where I was growing up during the elementary school days in South Korea. For people who don't know South Korea, there's regions. This is a region where it's considered uneducated, less culture, backwards, or simply you can say redneck region of South Korea. <laughs> but from there, she won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Which is to say, don't ever look down on people living in the inner cities of Baltimore, or people living in the Appalachian Mountains, or people living in Puerto Rico. They may surprise you. But there's something else. Her book was partly based on history of the city that I grew up in, elementary school days. There was large protests. Korea did not have a democracy, no voting, or a uh, dictator. And there was a protest to say, let us vote. And people from the government say, look, those backward people protesting, bring out the guns, and they shot about 1,000 people. So to, she was looking at the literature about how good the human being's capacity and how uh, bad the potential for human, you know, the, the bad act possibility. But I think all this comes down to the fact that South Korea understood what happened here in Boston. 
city upon a hill. I think many, many other parts of the country always look towards America to say, yeah, we want to be like America. So as you are doing some of the tours, keep in mind, Boston, city on a hill trying to show the world about self-government. But I also want to show this part. Thank you for 1,000 people who registered to run. Boston is also famous for its marathon. But I love Washington, D.C. Marine Corps Marathon far more. And here's why. You don't have to qualify. It's a fundraiser. You pay your money, and you can run. But when you see the people who are running, it amazes you. People without a leg, they are doing a wheelchair. And you are on the sideline. It's close to my home when I, you know, they go past my home. So I'm out there just cheering. And sometimes, you know, it makes me almost tearful. Some people are wearing like Halloween costumes, you know, running like that. Other people have a name. Maybe they're in memory, in memory of someone they are running. Some people have rainbow flag. They are running. Some people may have the Jewish cap. Other people with small Palestinian flag. But one thing that you do as a spectator is when they are passing, you say, go, go, go. Why? Because this is an individual effort, one step at a time going forward, forward. And it's not about fighting. It's just about self-improvement. So you just simply say, go, go, go. It doesn't matter who you are. And for real estate, the best person to explain to you, go, 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 is Jessica Lutz, who's going to come up to show you all the data so you can make the go, go, go effort here in your real estate career. Woo, go, 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 all right. Okay, y'all, so Lawrence just gave you a ton of fascinating information. My biggest takeaway is how unaffordable this housing market is, how limited the inventory still is. Even though it's coming up, we still know we have very limited inventory, so we have a long way to go. So let's talk about what home buyers are actually doing, what they've experienced in the last year, who's getting into the market. So the first slide that I'll give you, the income. The income of home buyers has jumped a lot. In the last two years, the typical income of a first time home buyer is up $26,000. This does not mean that everyone who purchased a home in the last two years got a $26,000 raise. No, 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 that's not what it means. What it means is that teachers, first responders in your local communities are really being priced out of being able to purchase a home. That's what it means. The select few of first-time home buyers who can enter into the market are wealthy, they're richer, they have more money to be able to do so. This is an elite first-time home buyer this year. The other thing that we know is that all cash buyers are actually up. They're at the highest level we've ever seen. The equity that Lawrence talked about, homeowners really being the winners in today's housing market, they are able to make these purchases with all cash. Now I want you to keep in mind that as we look at repeat buyers, a third of them making all cash purchases. That tracks. We know they've been in their home for a long period of time. They're able to do this. So how in the world is one in 10 first-time home buyers being able to purchase with all cash? That's a crazy number, right? That really speaks to a very different first-time home buyer. So I want you to keep that in mind as I go to the next slide. And I show you that down payments across the board up. Again, it tracks for repeat buyers. They have this housing equity. If they're gonna finance, they're placing down a large down payment. They're offsetting that mortgage. Now, how are first-time home buyers doing it? Well, they're scraping together their down payment with savings, number one. Then there's a good old bank of mom and dad, number two, yeah? Are you all working with clients like that? That's about a quarter of home buyers today who are first-time home buyers. Then, for about 20% of them, they're actually taking stocks. They're taking 401ks, they're taking cryptocurrency, they're taking financial assets. And then what we're seeing is about 7% of first time home buyers this year are seeing that silver tsunami, that trickling of that generational transfer of wealth, inheritance. This is really striking. This is the first time we've seen it that high where 7% of first time home buyers can use inheritance for their down payment or to just purchase a home with all cash. This is a very different type of buyer. As we look at this, I wanna to say too that this map 
that our economists put together that talks about the migration flow matches very closely what Lawrence said about jobs. Where we see job growth is where we see migration flow. And we can see people moving in the blue to the Sun Belt heavily. We can see people still moving to the mountain states. People are enjoying these areas, and that's where they're going. But I want to put a finer point on it. With this year's profile of home buyers and sellers, what we found is that people are moving back to city centers. This is actually the highest share that we've seen in the last decade. We saw this huge migration flow out of city centers into small towns, into rural areas during COVID. We talked about it a lot. We talked about it as an industry, how people want backyards and two home offices and so on and so on, places for their kids to play. But now we're seeing the attraction of city centers is back there. It's back on. Now, what's going to happen when Amazon and Washington Post and all of these places say you have to come back to work five days a week? I only expect that number to go up because we're starting to see CEOs are dictating. But I say that hand in hand with the fact that when we look at home buyer activity, we see about a third of home buyers are factoring in where their job is to their neighborhood choice. If we look at that 10 years ago, it was more than half. So we see a very big change here in home buyer activity and what's important to them for their neighborhood choice. Their number one factor that they're factoring in for their neighborhood choice, where are my friends and family? Where's my support system? That's number one. And why? Well, we see a lot of older buyers, and I'll show you that. When we look at first time home buyers, Lawrence alluded to this, and I think it's fascinating and it's heartbreaking too, because we see this dichotomy in the market. It's a completely different market for a first time home buyer than an all cash buyer. I talked about the wealth that's being held by these repeat buyers and how easily they're making housing trades if they want to, if they want to be next to the grandbaby. But what we see here for first time home buyers, it's the lowest share we've ever recorded in our 43 year history of this data. It is striking. When we look before the Great Recession, the typical share of first time home buyers 40%, and now just 24%. So how old are they? Well, it's the first red bar. They're a median age of 38 years old. Yeah, the typical first time home buyer in this country is now closer to 40 than they are to 30. Yeah, they have to save for a longer period of time. They have to scrape together that money or just wait for mom and dad to give it to them. I don't know, it's one or the other, but this is what we're seeing. So I wanna tell you the good thing here. If we look past that, 38 year old, we can see a little boom at in the data in the millennial generation. In that blue, there is a large amount of young adults who are putting pressure on the housing market, on the rental market. They are desperately trying to enter into the market. We need to build more housing for these young adults because the silver tsunami is not coming immediately. It is a trickle. And the reason why I say that is when we look at the second red bar there, not a typo, 61 years old is the median age of a repeat buyer in this country. Yeah. So if we look at that 40 years ago, we actually know that the typical repeat buyer was 36 years old. That's younger to the, than today's first time home buyer. It is astronomically different over the last 40 years in real estate. As we look at that, the typical 61 year old doesn't plan on letting go in that home anytime soon. They're planning on living there for about 15 years. So if I add those numbers together, they're planning on aging in place. The idea that the silver tsunami will give all of this real estate to young adults, we have to let go of that and we have to just build more homes. Gen Xers, I skipped over you. You're totally fine. Moving on. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> You're used to it. Yes. <laughs> all right. So I want to give you another one here when I look at the demographics. It's a fascinating trend. Multi-generational buyers hit an all-time high this year. The number one reason to do that is for cost savings. People combining income, saying, I want this housing equity. I want to own a place. And so this jumped. Number two, aging parents, aging relatives, bringing those family members into a home. Number three, those young adults that you can't get rid of. They're also there. And so what I, I do want to touch on Gen Xers because when we look at this group, we can actually see this is more common among Gen Xers than anyone else. They're having to do this because they are now the sandwich generation. 
They are taking care of aging relatives, young kids, kids under and above the age of 18, and they have this financial pressure. And so as we see this change, I would expect this to increase unless we build more housing. But I know things like ADUs, accessory dwelling units, looking at bedrooms on main levels, all of these approaches could really help the US moving forward. The other one that I want to give you too is that there is a drop in marriage rates in this country. And as we look at this, back in the 1960s, 70% of American adults were married. Today, about half of American adults are married. So what do we see? Well, we see more singles in the market. We see about half of first-time home buyers overall are actually married. And we can see this among all generations. We can see the same pattern with repeat buyers. But wow, single women are killing it, right? Yes, yeah. They're doing so on a lower household income. They are outperforming their male counterparts on a much lower household income. She is saving, she is scrimping, she is saying, this is my priority, to have a place of my own. And they are a quarter of the first-time home buyer market. For repeat buyers, we also see them at a very large share. For overall, we're seeing them at 20%. They are absolutely killing it. In comparison to single men, 11%. Same level, they haven't really changed the last 40 years in the data. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the next one I'll give you is that we do know that there is a drop in birth rates in this country. People are having fewer kids than they have historically as well. But we also know there's more empty nesters as buyers. They're median age of 61 for repeat buyers, and they're outperforming those repeat buyers in the market. So they're less likely to have kids. So as we look at this, we can see an all time low in households who have a child under the age of 18. Why does this matter? Well, it's gonna change up what someone needs in their home. It's gonna change up their priorities at that location. We also know that just 39% of US households actually have a kid under the age of 18. Very low share if we look at this historically. Now 66% have a pet. Yeah. <laughs> Those fur babies are absolutely dominating what people actually want out of their homes. Do you all know it's a $147 billion business in the US that private jets have amenity kits for actual pets? So that, you know, their fur doesn't get dry or something, I don't know. But we do see that this is actually happening, that people are willing to spend money on their pets. We continue to see this in the data. And I put this in here only because it's a much lighter note and it's kind of fun to talk about. All right, so let me move on. This is my last three content slides here. It has been a very difficult, I know, last two years in the data. Lawrence talked about that. We know that home sales are lower. We know that it's always not the best things that we're hearing in the news. What I want to challenge you to do is to tell your story. And I absolutely think that you have a good story to tell. This is not from our profile of home buyers and seller, but this is from our care report. This is a report that we do every couple years, and we ask you how much you volunteer in your local communities. This is huge. 70% of you are investing a day out of your month to actually volunteer, to give back. You care more about your communities than the American public does, I promise you. And we absolutely see that in the BLS Time Use Survey. When we look at this, tell your story. Put it on social media, brag about yourself. It's a good story to tell. The other thing that I will say is that while this data was released before the practice changes, we know that it was in the media. We know that the media has been talking about the differences that are coming into real estate, but buyers still wanted you. They still absolutely used you. We see that buyer use of agents in last year, 88%. We know that they need help finding that right home, help with negotiation, help guiding them through that process. For the typical repeat buyer, they have not done this in 10 years. They are essentially a first time home buyer as well. They need your assistance. We also know that FISBOs this year, all time low. Just 6% of home sellers wanted to sell their home via FISBO. Yes. This is crazy when we see this data and we think about this market, we think about the demand that's out there, but no one wants to leave money on the table. They want your help marketing their home, finding that qualified actual buyer, making sure that they get the best price, walking them through that transaction. Everyone has a different business model, but the business model that is most popular in the US is actually full service. Someone who is going to bring them through that anxiety-filled transaction, 
from step A to step Z and past that. Keep that relationship going. It may not be them who's selling their home next. They may be staying in place for a long period of time, but they got kids, and those adult kids, they're going to want to get rid of at some point. They're going to be using mom and dad's money, that housing equity. Keep that relationship going. All right, thank you. Okay, I just turned on the mics in case anybody out in the internet world wants to say anything. Um, assuming this does not have a weird copyright thing, we're going to put this onto our YouTube page, so it'll be there forever if you need to get to it or get to parts of it. Um, the big thing I got out of it is we're through the hardest part, but we also have to look at who the people are that are actually able to buy homes. You know, because I keep thinking, okay, 38 and up, is that the TikTok generation? Where, where do we put our, our story out so that people know, you know, the ones that are able to buy and are looking at buying. My other side of that is, what can we do to help those younger people get into it earlier so they start building their wealth? So I just, I had a lot of, I feel optimism and excitement about how can we help people use this information and get to the next level with it. So any thoughts from here or online? Probably not, okay. There's another great video from uh, NARA that I'm going to try and share sometime. It's more on the leadership side of, it sounds weird, it's about love. <laughs> but it was a freaking amazing thing, and I'm going to try and find a time to share that with everybody, too. It may just end up on the YouTube channel. So anyway, everybody have a great day. Thanks, all of you, in internet world. And we will end this thing and go have fun and do something exciting with you. <laughs> It's rocket day. <laughs> 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 <laughs>